They rise from the earth like messengers from hell. The truth of the matter is that it's impossible for us to forecast exactly which volcano will erupt and when that might be. They possess the power that created our planet and they are capable of destroying it as well. Oh dear God, my God, this is hell. I honest to God believe I'm dead. We have lived with them since the dawn of time and we still stand in awe of their fury. They are volcanoes. upon a plaque placed near the base of Mount Vesuvius in 1632. It was a warning of the terrible power that the volcano possesses. And that warning holds true today. On May 18th, 1980, hell surfaced upon the earth. Mount St. Helens, a volcano in Oregon in the United States, erupted. And trapped in a descending cloud of ash, a cameraman named Doug Crockett recorded images of what he thought was his own death. I never really thought I'd believe this or, or say this, but at this moment, I honest to God believe I'm dead. Oh, dear God. My God, this is hell. I just can't describe it. It's pitch black. Just pitch black. This is, this is hell on earth I'm walking through. Oh, God. Many long hours later, a helicopter rescued him. But the devastation caused by that eruption remains today. Volcanoes are, are one of the most energetic or ferocious kinds of natural activities. Volcanoes can destroy, in, unfortunately, a number of ways. <clears throat> so I think mankind simply has to learn to live with the volcanoes and the devastation that they produce. Volcanoes are such incredible generators of energy. I mean, they're, they're a, to sound silly about it, perhaps they're a, a, raw, a raw point in the Earth's surface. The volcanoes are spectacular, and they're an indication that the Earth is alive and kicking. And every time a volcano erupts, it's just an indication that the Earth is a dynamic place. And the truth of the matter is that it's impossible for us to forecast exactly which volcano will erupt and when that might be. The word volcano comes from a small island off the coast of Italy, Vulcano. Its ancient residents believed that Vulcano was the chimney of the forge of Vulcan, the Roman god of blacksmithing. Those Romans were among the first to feel the wrath of a volcano when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, devastating the thriving merchant 
town of Pompeii and leaving us a sad record of the last moments of its inhabitants, caught and imprisoned in the ash and clay until they were rediscovered in the 1800s. Today they lie where they fell, mute testimony of the destructive capabilities of the volcano. Volcanoes are found all over the world and their locations give us a clue as to the reasons for their existence. Volcanoes are found along the edges of huge continental plates upon which the great land masses of the world rest. When these plates move, even slightly, the friction generates heat and that heat plus energy builds up pressure that can be relieved through an earthquake or a volcano. These eruptions can take many forms and unfortunately for the millions of people who live near volcanoes, all lethal. For example, one type is the tremendous paroxysmal explosion, the kind that destroyed Krakatoa in 1888, an explosion literally heard a thousand miles away. Another powerful type of eruption is the Strombolian, a spasmodic yet regular activity that takes place over a period of years. And finally, the Plinian, named after the great Roman naturalist who was killed in Pompeii. The human cost of one of these eruptions can be devastating. On the tiny island of Martinique in 1902, a shocked world learned just how enormous that toll could be. It was the beginning of a new century on this small French island located in the heart of the Caribbean. Life was good. St. Pierre lived in the shadow of a huge volcano, Mount Pele, 4,500 feet tall, almost 39 miles in diameter at the base. Pele was simply taken for granted by the 30,000 residents of this bustling town. But in the spring of 1902, something began to go wrong, terribly wrong. What happened was that the, the volcano had been in interruption, actually, for weeks or possibly even months before the, uh, the catastrophic event of 1902. Uh, what happened, essentially, was that although many people wanted to leave, they were encouraged by the authorities to stay. People were sort of kept in town for political reasons, and um, the eruption itself was, was not so tremendously large, but this village of 29,000 people it was in the wrong place at the wrong time. At approximately 8.02 on a May morning in 1902, Pele exploded sending a tornado-like cloud of ash that instantly enveloped the town. Over 29,000 people were suffocated, burned, or blown apart by this tremendous eruption. Only two survived. Never again would people ignore the warning signs of a volcanic eruption. Even as the rubble that was St. Pierre slowly cooled, scientists descended upon the scene, trying to add to the rapidly growing science of volcanology. Today, man can predict, but not stop, a volcano's eruption, and time has not lessened those eruptive powers in any degree. As catastrophic as that disaster was, it pales in comparison with the potential forces that lie beneath our feet, capable of erupting without notice. These terrible powers can be triggered instantly. Over the millennia, the Earth has been ravaged by forces beyond our imagination. There are two kinds of volcanic eruptions, similar only in their destructive capacity. They're capable of destroying everything in their path for thousands of miles. One such eruption is called the flood basalt. Rather than emerging from a mountaintop, this takes the form of long fissures that can spread lava over an area a hundred miles wide. Another kind of eruption is the ash flow, a subterranean collapse that could cover an area hundreds of miles in diameter. How would modern man react to the force of such a catastrophe? In 1980, there was what we could call a dress rehearsal, and the world watched as a paradise was turned into a desolate wasteland. Cascade mountain range in the Pacific Northwest of Canada and the United States is a magnificent landscape that justly provokes awe in all who live there. The 
jewel of this beautiful natural crown is a mountain called St. Helens. Before 1980, the area around Mount St. Helens was really beautiful and idyllic, especially on the north side of the mountain. A beautiful large lake, Spirit Lake, and many high mountain lakes stocked with trout and favorite meccas for fishing and uh, hunting and, and hiking. But in the spring of 1980, there was something wrong with that mountain. Things were turning very bad. In late March of 1980, earthquakes started coming from beneath the volcano. And then we found that the north side of the volcano was moving outward at a rate of five or six feet per day, for, uh, forming a gigantic bulge. And so it was pretty evident that something significant was going to happen. You're going to have to go, and the faster the better. One time, one thing, you got to go. Not everyone listened. Harry Truman, who owned a lodge alongside Spirit Lake, refused to leave. Despite the rumblings, he vowed to stay. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. But most knew something was about to happen, and it prepared for catastrophe. Anytime the mountain's bulging out six feet a day, you know it's going to blow. Everybody knew it was going to blow, and everybody was just watching it. I don't know why Truman stayed where he did, because, you know, sooner or later that just the law of gravity said that that side of the mountain would have to, you know, let loose. And by the morning of May the 18th, thousands watched and waited. It was a beautiful spring morning. Scientist David Johnson watched as a huge bulge began to grow on the mountainside around him. He was in the middle of a radio transmission. And his last words were, this is it. Mount St. Helens had come to life. People weren't caught by surprise when the volcano erupted. Uh, that was more or less expected, but the magnitude of the eruption took everybody by surprise. Uh, it had been considered as a worst case possibility that something such as what actually occurred could take place, but worst case events seldom happen, so we were looking for something smaller, and we were wrong. What happened is that the this bulge that had been forming on the north side of the mountain started to slide down slope, and this was just like removing the lid from a pressure cooker. It's been estimated that it was the equivalent of a, about a 17 megaton uh, nuclear weapon going off. Despite the near total devastation, experts say it could have been worse. Due to the efforts of scientists and park rangers, almost everyone on that mountainside had been evacuated. With the tragic exception of David Johnston, who gave his life so we might learn, all of the scientists were out of danger. Harry Truman, however, simply vanished. Those who were there can never forget. Everybody was in a state of shock. Our beautiful mountain had double-crossed us. The whole landscape was gray, quiet, real still, no birds singing, no bees buzzing. It was just really quiet. Everything just gray. This used to be the prettiest mountain in the world. Now it's the homeliest mountain in the world. Mount St. Helens was a lesson in what a volcano can do. The power of nature was not underestimated. Not this time. And brave men lost their lives so we might better understand these terrible events. It will take centuries for the Cascades to be reborn. A process that is taking place today in the shadow of Mount St. Helens. There are men and women who are living right on the brink of disaster, learning how to understand and even fight the awesome powers contained inside the heart of a volcano. Is what they have learned worth the risks taken? The marks of volcanoes are all around us. Throughout the world, one can find basalt, pumice, even samples of lava. And on the Hawaiian Islands, there are beautiful volcanic glass sculptures called Pele's Tears, named after the Hawaiian goddess of the volcano. There, volcanoes are a part of everyday life. According to Hawaiian legend, the goddess Pele is responsible for the volcanic activity in Hawaii. She was briefly married to Kampua, the god of war. Unfortunately, the marriage had a few problems, and Pele kicked the god of war out, chasing him into the sea with streams of lava. 
the goddess Pele has been seen by many, many people on many different occasions, or so they say. Now you don't necessarily have to believe it. But, um, you know, I'm not going to say it didn't happen. You know, stranger things than have happened in life. Now, this tale has been elaborated upon in a more scientific manner by the people who work here at the Hawaiian Volcanic Observatory. Every day they poke, prod, and test the still active volcano in the hopes of understanding the non-legendary reasons for its existence. The Volcano Observatory has a major function as a training ground. You'll find probably any volcano observatory in the world has people on its staff, certainly that have been here, and certainly they use equipment that we've probably developed here. Actually, living on the volcano, I guess we're just like anyone else. The level of danger really isn't that very high if you keep aware of what's going on around you. It's obviously very dangerous to go out and come in contact with something that's as hot as the active lava is. But if you're aware of it, it's just like driving an automobile in many ways. If you stay in your own lane and pay attention to what's going on around you, then it's a reasonably safe job. Volcanologists respect volcanoes and regard these forces of nature as almost living things. I've spent quite a bit of time living and working uh, uh, around active volcanoes uh, where, where there are a lot of people living and, and it, you know, it's a major influence on their lives. Some volcanoes are more beautiful than others, some are more ominous than others, some more lives are threatened, but uh, here in Hawaii, volcanoes are peaceful enough, it can be a friendly relationship. I find a lot of things stimulating about being a volcanologist. Um, it's, it's a very good opportunity to make use of my scientific training for the public good. Volcanologists are like firemen. Uh, they have to respond to emergencies and sometimes these emergencies can be hazardous to your health. And, and that was unfortunately the case for the volcanologist studying Mount St. Helens. And it was a very unfortunate circumstance that uh, one of our team had to be killed. Uh, others could have been in this place. We were a very dedicated team at that time. And I, I think we still are dedicated, putting in long hours at the mountain with tedious uh, monitoring. So somewhere at this very moment, dedicated men and women are standing literally on the edge of the world, putting their lives on the line for knowledge. There are ways that man can coexist with volcanoes. In fact, Volcanoes and the tremendous power they generate may well be a solution to one of the most pressing crises mankind now faces. Energy and our lack of it. We need to examine how the power of the volcano can be captured and harnessed. It would take over 2,000 times the world's supply of coal to produce the heat that can be found in the upper six miles of the Earth's crust. And that force has been tapped here in this huge power station in Northern California in the United States. Geothermal technology is rapidly being developed and it may reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and upon the risky benefits of nuclear power. One of the byproducts of volcanism is the fact that uh, it creates uh, hot water and steam underground. And under favorable circumstances, this heat can be tapped to form geothermal energy. And that's one of the, one of the good things that comes from volcanic activity that people sometimes don't realize. I think mankind simply has to learn to live with the volcanoes and the devastation that they produce. And remember, the devastation from one generation creates arable land for the next. My feeling is that people should be aware of the hazardous aspects of volcanoes. They should be educated in terms of how they might need to respond if an eruption seems imminent. But at that point, they should go ahead and, and enjoy playing on volcanoes and skiing off of them and so forth. In other words, for recreational places, I think they're unexcelled. There's no reason to limit the access to volcanoes while they're quiet. Volcanoes are windows into our ancient past, indeed rips in time itself. Under our feet, the earth is still being born, the ground shuddering from the force of nature's labor, and volcanoes are an all too visible symbol of this process of creation, this process of eternal renewal. Man has worshipped, feared, fought, and escaped from volcanoes since the dawn of time. But it's only in the last few hundred years that we have really tried to understand the miraculous power contained within this phenomenon. We are guests on this earth. And the more we understand, 
the more we can derive from our lives on this planet. The volcano, a terrible force. A force to be reckoned with. presents information based in part on theories and opinions, some of which are controversial. The producer's purpose is not to validate any side of an issue, but through the use of actualities and dramatic recreation, relate a possible answer, but not the only answer, to this material. Transportation for Secrets and Mysteries provided by Delta Airlines. We love to fly and it shows. Hotel accommodations for Secrets and Mysteries provided by the Outrigger Reef, one of 20 Outrigger hotels located in beautiful Waikiki. For reservations, see your travel agent. United States, half of its population believed that the universe is inhabited by other intelligent life. The rest of the world cannot be far behind. The 1950s witnessed a sharp increase in the number of sightings all around the world, and with it, more and more evidence that something unusual was happening in our skies. Even the United States government took notice, beginning an official Air Force investigation called Project Blue Book. Their files soon overflowed with more than 12,000 sightings. These water beasts may well be the most ancient surviving inhabitants of our planet. Did I see the monster? I don't know. But I do believe that, you know, I saw, I obviously saw some things and nobody's been able to tell me what I saw. So I think I must have seen the monster. Stonehenge. That place has become a metaphor for the magnificent, the unfathomable, and the mysterious. I have the feeling that the people who built it had something very strong in mind, maybe more than the astronomy and the worship. And I wish to goodness I knew what it was, and maybe I never will. German scientist Werner von Braun is considered to be the architect of America's space program. Von Braun and his team took the technology from the German V-2 rocket, which had been created for destruction, and applied it to the development of the chariots that would take man to new worlds. There's never been an astronaut who got on a spacecraft, whether it was Mercury, Apollo, or even shuttle, who didn't fully understand the risk involved and who wasn't willing to take them. The only voyage of the Titanic was surrounded by bad luck that defies belief. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was as if she was cursed. A curse, some say, began when she was launched. When happened, he came back. He says, it's nothing much. They only struck him, I suppose. This magnificent object is a symbol of genius, of ambition, and of dedication, for it is believed to have taken 30 years to construct. And that construction is not the least of its miracles. It stands as you know, one of the most prominent monuments for its size and complexity and also its a lack of information about it. To be able to plan and economically accomplish such a large feat for the pharaoh is extraordinary. This is the mark of Sasquatch, taken from a set of tracks that covered a five-mile stretch of dense forest. The 
depth of each print indicates that whatever made it weighed 800 pounds. 800 pounds. And there's other, more dramatic evidence. On a hot afternoon in October, Roger Patterson and a friend were riding through some woods in Northern California. Suddenly their horses shied. They looked ahead and saw something squatting by the creek. As the creature ambled away, Patterson took this film, film that has been analyzed, debated, and contested ever since. <laughs> 